Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Snatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's resume our physiology playlist. We're talking about gastrointestinal physiology. In previous videos, we talked about the enteric nervous system, my enteric and submucosal plexus. We talked about the difference between slow wave rhythms and spike potentials. We talked about mastication, salivation, and deglutition. After deglutition, i.e. swallowing, the food is going to end up in your stomach. Today, we'll talk about stomach motility including receptive relaxation. In the next video, we'll talk about stomach secretions. Here's your lovely stomach. What's that? Cardiac notch. This area is called the cardia because it's near your heart. That's why people say, I have heartburn. It's not burning your heart, it's just close to your heart. After this, we have the fundus of the stomach, the body of the stomach, the antrum, and then the pylorus. What does the word antrum mean? Entry to entry to the what to the stomach shut up it's entry to the pylorus entry to the duodenum before the stomach there is the lower esophageal sphincter at the gastroesophageal junction after the stomach or distal to the stomach you have the pyloric sphincter at the gastroduodenal junction this part of the stomach is called the lesser curvature and this part is called the greater curvature here is an anatomy hint the arteries on this border are called gastric arteries, such as left gastric and right gastric. The arteries at this border are called gastroepiploic arteries, such as the left gastroepiploic artery and the right gastroepiploic artery. All of this was the lovely anatomy. Physiologically speaking, the stomach is divided into a proximal motor unit, very good at storage, thank you, receptive relaxation, and a distal motor unit, very good at mixing, propulsing, and emptying the stomach. Thanks to my peristalsis and mixing movements. Thank you, my enteric nervous system. Let's review the wall of the stomach, mucosa, submucosa, musculosa, serosa. The submucosal plexus is in the submucosa. The myenteric plexus is in the musculosa. Submucosal plexus in the submucosa for secretions. But the myenteric plexus is in the musculosa for motility. Together, they are called the enteric nervous system. All of this is within the wall of your gut. Add to that something from without. The parasympathetic nervous system, which stimulates everything, and the sympathetic nervous system, which inhibits everything. Because this is rest and digest, but that is fight and flight. When you're running from a tiger, do you think you have time to digest? Hell no! Submucosal, myenteric. Pause and review. Submucosal, myenteric. And then add to that parasympathetic, which will boost motility and secretion, as well as sympathetic, which inhibits motility and secretion. Myenteric is for motility, submucosal is for secretion and local blood flow and some infoldings. The parasympathetic to the stomach is the vagus nerve originating in the medulla and then reaching the stomach. But the sympathetic nervous system that goes to the stomach is here, usually in the thoracic segments, starting from T5, T6, T7, etc. Also known as the greater splanchnic nerve. There are three splanchnic nerves that you need to be aware of. The greater splanchnic nerve, which is sympathetic to the abdomen, lesser splanchnic nerve, which is sympathetic to the pelvis, and pelvic splanchnic nerve, or simply pelvic nerves, which is parasympathetic to the pelvis. The parasympathetic nervous system that goes to the stomach is the vagus. The sympathetic that goes to the stomach is the greater splanchnic nerve. The vagus will boost motility and secretion. The sympathetic will inhibit motility and secretion. How did the sympathetic inhibit motility and secretion? It's called norepinephrine from the nerve endings. Epinephrine and norepinephrine from the adrenal medulla. How do the parasympathetic nervous system boost motility and secretions? Well, you have acetylcholine from the vagus nerve, i.e. cholinergic fibers, because acetylcholine is cholinergic. And then we also have a GRP, or gastrin-releasing peptide. Guess what? It's gonna release gastrin. And ATP, adenosine triphosphate. If you remember, adenine is a purine, not a pyrimidine. So we call these purinergic fibers. They inhibit motility. Why do I need to inhibit motility? Because I need the fundus and the body of my stomach to relax 
so that my stomach can get bigger and receive tons of food. Relaxation that make me receptive to food. This is the story of receptive relaxation. I don't understand how come the same nerve increases motility here but relaxes the stomach here. Because it's using different neurotransmitters, doofus. Receptive relaxation. Let me relax and receive the food. It happens in the proximal motor unit, mostly fundus and body. This helps the stomach relax and enlarge and get bigger and increase from a capacity of 50 mLs to a capacity of 1500 mLs. More than 10 times increase in capacity. That's amazing. What's the stimulus for this lovely reflex? The entry of the food to the stomach. The afferent is vagus and sympathetic fibers. They go to the brain and the medulla, especially the vagus. The efferent is vagus to relax this part of the stomach. Thank you so much, ATP. Sympathetic binaural epinephrine is always inhibiting the stomach, so it can help here. Their response is relaxation, which is opposite of contraction, to the fundus of the stomach and the body as well. If you have watched my pulmonology playlist, I've told you before that receptive relaxation is analogous to compliance of the lung. The lung is also able to relax and receive lots of air. There is another organ that has compliance. Your urinary bladder can get way big. It can distend to fill up with urine. There is a fourth organ that has compliance, but let's keep it clean. According to physics, compliance is the change in volume over change in pressure. As your stomach increases in size, delta V will go up and compliance goes up. Hashtag receptive relaxation. Gastric motility, like any motility, has propulsive movements and mixing movements. And we have talked about all of this in a separate video titled GI motility. And you will find that video in this physiology playlist. Do you remember the slow wave rhythm? Yeah, they are not true action potentials. They are just humming and buzzing in the background with a rate of three times per minute, and this will be very important soon, and the spike potential, which is true action potential, which causes true contraction. Here are the slow waves buzzing in the background, and then if they reach the threshold, boom, we have spike potential, which is a true action potential. Thank you, calcium influx. Here's the stomach. The food has reached the stomach. Slow waves, three per minute. If I reach the threshold, boom, spike potential, which is actual action potential, causing actual contractions of the stomach, propulsive movements, mixing movements. After you finish digesting the food, you can throw it out into the duodenum. This is called gastric emptying from the stomach to the duodenum. These strong contractions will start here in the mid stomach, usually closer to the greater curvature of the stomach. This area of the stomach is called the pacemaker of the stomach. As you go from here to here, your contractions get stronger and faster and more robust. And then I will empty this part to the duodenum. And then I will start cleaning this way, and this way, and this way, and this way, until I get every particle that is hidden in the fundus. Which means as the stomach becomes more empty, contractions will start further and further and further from the pylorus, and closer and closer and closer to the fundus, until you get everything out of the stomach. Let's talk about getting things out of the stomach, which is called gastric emptying. What are the factors that boost gastric emptying? Distension of the stomach, because there is food. Of course, if there is food, eventually I'll need to empty it. Gastrin is the only GI hormone that is pro-gastric motility and secretion. Motilin can also help with gastric emptying. The myenteric plexus in the enteric nervous system and the parasympathetic fibers, thank you vagus, can also boost the emptying. The gastric distension will increase gastric volume, which will stimulate the ENS and the PANS even more. If you're drinking soup, it boosts gastric emptying. That's why many cuisines will use soups as an appetizer before your main entree. What are the factors that inhibit gastric emptying? Duodenal distension, because remember, the duodenum hates the stomach and the stomach hates the duodenum. 
That's why gastrin is pro-stomach and therefore anti-duodenum. Conversely, CCK and secretin are pro-duodenum and anti-stomach. For a very simple reason, the stomach is acidic, the duodenum is alkaline. If food reaches the duodenum, lots of acid is gonna be dished into the duodenum and the duodenum will say, what the hell? Hey stomach, why don't you calm down a little bit? You're throwing too much acid in my face. Stop it. We call this the enterogastric reflex. CCK and secretin and GIP are pro-duodenum and anti-stomach. Next, the topic of hunger contractions. If you eat a lot of food, your satiety center will get stimulated because you are satiated with food. That's why there is no need for hunger contractions. But if you're starving, your feeding center will get alerted and will boost your hunger contractions, trying to convince you to eat. So the feeding center and the satiety center are opposites. They hate each other. If I'm starving, the feeding center gets alerted and boosts hunger contractions. If I'm starving, blood sugar is plummeting, which removes the inhibitory effect of the satiety center on the feeding center. So the feeding center is now the only game in town, causing tons of hunger contractions. They can get very strong and we call them hunger pangs. These contractions usually peak around day three or four after the last meal. Next, they will decline. This might help you determine when the last time this patient had a meal was. Moreover, the vagus can add insult to injury by causing even stronger hunger contractions, and now it's not just a wave that comes and goes, they can become continuous, called titanic contractions. The word titanic means continuous, and they can last for minutes continuously, non-stop. The younger you are, the healthier you are, the more hypoglycemic you are, the stronger your hunger contractions. If you like this video, you will love my renal physiology course, which you can download at medicosisperfectsnetis.com. In the next video, we'll talk about gastric secretions. So please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my premium courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfect Schnellus, where medicine makes perfect sense.